What is going on, listeners? I am your host, Jonathan Yamasaki for Go Entrepreneur Yourself. We are a podcast that features entrepreneurs and leaders from around the country to share their story about adversity, triumph, and their business. Today, we bring you an entrepreneurial thought leader, author, and online marketing expert, Stefan Arstel of Tower Paddleboards, a company that he pitched on Shark Tank and received funding from billionaire Mark Cuban. Tattle Powderboards, a direct-to-consumer brand focusing on beach lifestyle products, was created with the customer's wallet in mind. With more than a decade of ex- experience helping paddleboard enthusiasts find quality paddleboards, Stefan has been the pioneer in creating inflatable stand-up paddleboards at surprising low prices that do not diminish quality. He's also the author of the 5-Hour Workday featured on CNN, The Huffington Post, Fox & Friends, Thank you so much, Stefan, for coming on to our show to talk about your book and your entrepreneurial journey. Thanks for having me on, Jonathan. Yeah, of course. Now, before we get to the, your book and Tower Paddleboards, I want to give our audience a chance to get to know you on a personal level. So I do this uh, segment called The Fast Five. So I'm going to ask you quick questions and then give me quick responses, whatever comes to your head first, all right? Okay, sounds good. Cheers. Perfect. Uh, so if you can have any animal as a pet, real or made up, what would it be? A dolphin, I think. Awesome. What's the one thing you miss most before the pandemic? Oh, yeah. I suppose going out to eat. That was real. That was real De- Debbie Downer when you <laughs> can't go to restaurants. Yeah, that, that is really true. They started making all those uh, all those curfews so you couldn't go out. <laughs> well, and another thing there, I would say I got COVID and I lost and I had it like last July and I lost my sense of smell and taste, and I still can't smell and taste. Everything has it's like COVID flavor, so I miss my smell and taste. No way. <laughs> it, are you saying that you still feel that way? Yeah, it's like nine months later. So oh wow, I'm wondering okay. if it is going to come back at this point. Okay, hopefully. Um, so this next question's uh, going to be funny, but if you can eat one food for the rest of your life, what would it be? Uh, if I, one food for the rest of my life. Oh, probably like prawns. Oh, okay. Yes. Delicious. Yeah. Well, hopefully seafood. you can taste again. <laughs> <laughs> and then room, desk, or car, which do you clean first? Uh, I don't really clean my desk much. It's uh, pretty <laughs> messy. Uh, so yeah, probably room. Okay. Probably room. <laughs> nice. And then uh, last question. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? You know, I always wanted to be a professional basketball player as a kid. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know if I would like to attempt that now, but uh, that was that was my dream as a child. Nice. Yeah, I, I loved I played basketball in middle school and I, I couldn't um, because of my height. I, I would not be able to make any pro league. <laughs> yeah, I don't either. I mean, strangely enough, though, my business partner owns a professional basketball team. So, oh, that's you know, awesome. In one way, I, I, I got related somehow. Close, <laughs> close enough, right? <laughs> yeah, that's as close as I'm going to get. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. That was the fast five. So, let's talk about you and your business. How did you get started in this business? Walk me through it. So, with uh, you know, Tower uh, Paddle Boards was started in 2010. And really, I had been in the um, in the online space since 1999. And that's when I got out of grad school, and I went to grad school really to get out of bartending. Put myself through school as a bike of bartender, but mm. the business job I got was just paying me nothing. So I had to bartend on the weekends to, uh, to pay my rent here in San Diego, and so I ended up going to grad school basically to get out of bartending. Timing, as luck would have it, I got out right in 1999, and they were just handing out internet jobs, you know, with your with your diploma. And so it was the right time at the right place. And, uh, you know, I, I went and worked for another company for about five years, a company called antmini.com, which was a, a portal for the radiology community. And we went from, you know, startup, like we didn't even have the website up when I joined it, to dominant industry leader in three years. And in wow. the, the medical imaging field, like we, we sort of took over for the, like the trade journals and stuff like that and all, you know. And so I saw sort of the power of online and how you can create these like monopolies and just like take over an industry overnight. <laughs> and, you know, I was the biz dev guy for that company. It was a very small company. We started, I think there was five or seven people. And about four years in, I, you know, I, I'd always wanted to do my own business. And so I started working on a couple of little side businesses. And then I started uh, buypokerchips.com at the time, uh, poker 
was going crazy. It was on, it was on TV and the World Series of Poker was blowing up. And this guy named Chris Moneymaker won the World Series of Poker. There was just boom in poker. And I saw that and I had a poker game with friends and I was like, man, it'd be so nice to have those casino chips, like the nice clay casino chips for a home game. And I went to try and buy them and it was like, you know, it took four or six months to have these things, you know, made and delivered. I'm like, that's oh, wow. insane. So I just ordered my own custom generic like looking set and then sold it to other people. But I would deliver it overnight or uh, ship right away because mm. gamblers are noto- notoriously <laughs> like impatient. Yeah. And uh, so that was that was the business plan <laughs> right there. And it, it sort of took off. And after a year, I, I jumped ship. and But not until I was doing like 50000 a month in revenue because I had a baby on the way and I really like couldn't afford to do that. I was still... Uh, you know, had a negative net worth because grad school debt and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And so I did that for um, five or six years. Um, and the poker chip business sort of took off. I thought I was going to retire after about a year. Literally, when my, my son was born, I was reading like yacht magazines in the, like, the delivery room, thinking that oh, life's easy, right? <laughs> and that was the peak <laughs> of the business. And then it started to sort of slowly like go down. You know, everything online sort of gets commoditized or somebody sees you do something and they'll copy what you did. Yeah. So, I tried starting other businesses and failed, you know, with a lot of them and some were like middling success. And then in 2010, a buddy of mine took me out uh, stand up paddleboarding here in La Jolla, out in the waves. And I was like, this is it. This is, I went and bought a board and they were super expensive. So I figured we could go direct to consumer and sell them for half price and uh, we could, we could make a good business. And that's what we did. You know, and four years later, we were the number one fastest growing private company in San Diego in 2014 and 2015 we were number 239 on the inc 500 of america's fastest growing companies with a small small team that's wonderful yeah i read somewhere you had like a team of seven i think or like less than 10 right now we have five so we'll do about six million this year um and so we're very like highly leveraged and we have four business units now so we've got tower paddle boards which is the you know sort of the bread and butter company and then about two years ago, we started Tower Electric Bikes, which is also direct-to-consumer electric bikes, which is just booming now. It's basically where paddleboards were back in the day, right. competing with like 300 brands already. But we feel we can navigate that and build the same thing. I mean, we're basically a market leader in paddleboards and inflatable paddleboards. We're the most searched brand in that industry and mm-hmm. just at an incredible value proposition. We feel we can do the same in, in e-bikes. And then we've diversified into... Uh, offline into the Tower Beach Club, which is like an event space. And then we have, so instead of paying rent for our offices and showroom, we collect rent because we office out of the back. We do pop-up retail in it. And then when someone wants to throw a wedding, we clear out and, you know, they give us six grand to, you know, do a wedding here. So nice. we, we've diversified uh, because of my learnings. a business a business. <laughs> yeah, we've diversified because of my learnings in buypokerchips.com. Everything's going to get disrupted. You got to sort of prepare and be ready for this to disappear. And what else are you going to do? Yeah. What is it about your company that customers select your inflatable boards over other inflatable boards? Can yours like withstand a beating? Well, I mean, inflatable boards in general can. When we started our business, inflatable boards were probably 1% of the market. Mm-hmm. Um, but I came from the poker chip business, which was an e-commerce business, right? You yeah. put stuff in the UPS <laughs> box and ship it. And poker chips are great because they're super tiny and pretty valuable. Yeah. So you can ship this box anywhere in the world for relatively cheap. Paddle boards, traditional paddle boards, 12 feet long, 3 feet wide. Right. you got to put them on a, a freight truck. And then it's 150 bucks to send them anywhere. And then if it gets damaged, and like 15% of them get damaged, it's 150 oh. bucks to send it back. So you just lost 300 bucks for the privilege of you know serving somebody a <laughs> selling somebody a paddleboard it's a horrible business right <laughs> and so even though we were having this success i'm like man this is a nightmare of a business compared to the poker chips i wish those inflatable paddleboards didn't suck so bad and so we improved upon the inflatable paddleboard we just made it thicker and that uh, made it more rigid and we came from outside the industry like everybody in the in the paddleboard industry was from the surf industry or the windsurfing industry and mm-hmm. When they made inflatable surfboards, which had been around for probably 10 years at the time, they made them the same thickness as a surfboard. Mm. And it was like two and a half inches thick. And it's just a piece of crap. Like this is, <laughs> you, you could take it to Costa Rica, but it's kind of like just, you know, not really having a surfboard. When they made paddle boards, they just made them a little thicker because that was their uh, worldview was how thick this board needed to be. 
And I'm like, well, this thing is a piece of crap. Like it's, uh, it's just really like bendy. It goes like a banana through the water. Why don't we just make it cartoonishly thick? Like make it 10, 12 inches thick. We made an eight inch yeah. thick paddle board and uh, we're like, that fixed it. <laughs> now it's super rigid. <laughs> and it's actually an exponential effect. If you double the thickness of like a, a board um, in engineering, the rigidity goes up 800%. Oh, wow. So by making that little change, we change the market. And there was another company that was doing kind of about the same time as us, but I think we were we were really on the cutting edge of that because we were in the e-commerce business. We were shipping right. packages, and since then, you know, it was one percent of the market inflatables at the time. Now it's well over seventy percent of the market. So it really changed the market. Mm -hmm. How were you able to make uh, these paddle boards more affordable? Describe that process. Yeah, so I mean that's the interesting thing is we we really didn't even set out to innovate on the product front. We just said paddle boards are good enough. You just it's like <laughs> a big board, you paddle it around. There's not too much to it. And a lot of the companies were really like getting all technical and trying to do that. <laughs> There's probably companies that make a lot more technical paddle boards than us, but a lot of them uh, have gone out of businesses, right? Yeah. All we did is we innovated distribution. So in the in a similar uh, vein to like what Netflix did. Like Netflix mm -hmm. didn't reinvent the movie. I mean, now they do their own movies, but initially right. they just changed distribution. They were sending them in a mailbox and then the world changed again. So then they were streaming them online. And so Blockbuster, which was, you know, dominating the world of sort of video rentals, like they completely went out of business. They were laughing at Netflix when they said, because what are you guys doing? You're just changing distribution, but distribution's mm -hmm. huge. So yeah. when you, when you think about innovation, everybody thinks about, oh, I'm going to build a, I'm going to invent something that nobody's ever seen before, or I'm going to uh, make a make a better mouse trap here. You know that innovation is like hard and really where right. the world is going because of the internet, the connectivity of one person to the other. Distribution channels are being disrupted, so all of the middlemen right. are disappearing. This is another website in our diversification, you know, ploy here um, that we've created called NoMiddleman.com. Which lists, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's an aggregation of all the direct to consumer brands in the world, a very curated list of them, because really they are the best value out there. And but you mm -hmm. just got to find them. So we've created sort of a directory, you know, made it searchable, kind of an everything showroom of them. Reminds me about like making your company more op optimal and, and sustainable for the long run and cr helping to increase that productivity. So that you're able to find just better ways to be able to get profit from your business. Also, at the end, helping your customers because they'll get it at a better rate. So that's great. I, I want to get back to, to telling our audience about that process of what it was like to be behind the scenes of Shark Tank. Because you were able to obviously leverage Mark Cuban, uh, his name, to help. And also his the investment to help uh, send your business flying. So tell us about what it was like behind the scenes. Yeah, so uh, I I had ever actually never even heard of Shark Tank. They reached out to us, just randomly called us <laughs> at the time. It was season two of Shark Tank, and at that time they would still sort of hand pick companies, right? Uh -huh. they would, if a company went on the Oprah show, they might pick that, or they might pick this other company. <laughs> and at the time, paddle boards were like surging in popularity. It was a very uh -huh. trendy thing. You were seeing this in the magazine, some celebrity. And that was really what was driving the, the you know, 100% growth year over year. And the, and the producers knew this. And they're like, we want to get a paddleboard company on here. So they went and Googled paddleboards. We're an SEO company in the paddleboard market. <laughs> so at the time, we're like, you know, we have 35,000 in sales lifetime. We're a tiny company. We're at the top of the search engines. And so the producers think, well, these guys are, you know, they're, they're one of the best companies out there. So they called, would you want to be on the show? They call us and uh, when the media calls, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll get, they'll talk to you for an hour, get you all excited and then say, oh, and by the way, there's a $19,000 pre-production fee, um, you know, to be on the show. And I'm like, oh, no. come on, why do you waste an hour of my time? We don't have a budget. <laughs> like, so, but when the uh, Shark Tank producer called, I sort of cut to the chase and I just said, I don't mean to be rude, but we're really busy. We're coming into our busy season here. Like, if this is real media, like the cool but if there's like a fee or pre-production and he's like, uh -huh. no, 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 we're on ABC on Friday night. And I'm like, what are you talking about? How have I never heard of this show? <laughs> <laughs> because it sounds like something I would be interested in, right? Yeah. So then five weeks later, I'm up there um, sequestered in a hotel in LA and I'm having to prepare my pitch and everything while my business is just sort of going off here. I only hired my first employee three weeks before going on that show too. Mm -hmm. And we're going into the busy season. And so I was really worried about just even remembering the sharks' names. 
and memorizing <laughs> yeah. like a two minute pitch. It's not my uh, forte. And then two days into it, they said, oh, and by the way, Mark Cuban is going to be the guest shark on your episode. And I'm like, well, I know who that guy is. So uh, that was, I was like, wow, like that would be a celebrity endorsement in addition to the money. So that was uh -huh. sort of, I was valuing his money at kind of three times everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, but when I went on there, uh, I'm known as the worst pitch in the history of Shark Tank that still landed a deal. <laughs> so I went in there, uh, my slideshow like shot through all the slides. I like forgot my pitch like halfway through it uh -huh. and then tried to like robotically like go to it again and then i was like silent for minutes at a time in live time <laughs> and these guys are these sharks are like tearing into me i got called a nerd and a leprechaun and what uh, i got told it was the worst day <laughs> the biggest flop of my life and all this stuff and so i had to like have sort of a out-of-body experience there on the mm -hmm. set and sort of say wow dude like you you need to just reset and come back here uh -huh. And we ended up getting a deal from Cuban for $150,000 for 30%, and which gives us a half million dollar valuation. And at the time of the pitch, this was five weeks post that initial call, we had mm -hmm. maybe $100,000 in lifetime sales. Um, but the other sharks thought this was like ridiculous. Like they were, they're like, you're way overpaying for this, Mark. Like this is crazy. And they're just mm -hmm. laughing at him, you know. And, um, since then, we've gone on to do 40 million in sales, and we're oh, wow. uh, Cuban's best pitch in the history of Shark Tank. And so yeah. he, he definitely saw something. Yeah, that's incredible. And uh, even now, I saw on your website a picture of him with your new, your newer product line, the electric bikes. Tower electric bikes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they look amazing. They look great. I didn't even know there was such thing as, I mean, I've seen uh, bikes where people put a, a, a little motor on their bike so they can move it, but I've never seen an electric bike. Yeah, electric bikes are, they're absolutely exploding. I mean, this market in 2018 in the US, uh, mm -hmm. there was 300,000 electric bikes sold in the US oh, in that year. Um, a... In 10 years, it's going to be 7 million a year, which oh, is more wow. than the number of cars sold. So this is a market that is just experiencing rapid, rapid growth. Yeah. And that's awesome. Do you still talk to Mark Cuban from time to time? Well, I don't have his phone number, so I never talk to him, but it's all <laughs> by email. And he's very accessible by email. I really didn't expect that when we first signed the deal because I kind of mm -hmm. negotiated the deal with his uh, like his, his legal point people. Yeah. Uh, but then once the deal was signed, they're like, okay, CC Mark on you know everything. And I'm like, well, sweet. At least he's going to get to some visibility into what we're yeah. doing. Um, so I thought that was cool. But, you know, the first email I sent, I think he responded back in like eight minutes and was like swearing at me. From, Don't be an idiot. Don't do this. <laughs> like, so it's really emailing him and seeing the rest of his team. And I think oh, we've okay. we've done well for him. I mean, we've cashed him out well over a million dollars in dividends. Um, and he still owns, you know, his, his percent of the company. Mm -hmm. So he's happy with us and he gives us the time of day, but he's accessible anytime. That's great. And I heard an, an interview on another podcast called We Study Billionaires. And what was shocking to me is you said something about your pitch that it was actually 45 minutes. And th that's crazy to me because the show, well, each person that comes and walks out there, it's only like, you know, 15 minutes or so that you're on TV. So this had me thinking, was there anything that wasn't aired on the show that enticed Mark Cuban or any of the other sharks to want to invest into your business? Yeah, for, for sure. And some people pitch like an hour and a half back oh, there. Oh my gosh. You know, so what you're seeing <laughs> is really like a highlight reel of an of an NFL game and mm -hmm. edited how the editors want to, to edit it. Mm -hmm. So my pitch was almost like it was like hard for them to even edit together because it was so it was so <laughs> weird because I came out there, I make just an ass of myself and then they're making fun of me. And then three sharks are out like right away, right? Like, oh my God. And I'm starting to get panicked. Like, oh my God, like I'm not even going to get out of here with a deal. I mean, I literally went in there thinking it was going to be a bidding war for sure. Like, right. <laughs> um, so then I had that moment and I sort of reset myself, but then they started the question and answer period. And I started mm -hmm. to sort of get myself back together and I was doing a pretty good job of the question and answer, but still those three sharks went out pretty quickly. Nobody was interested in the paddleboard business mm -hmm. because we didn't have intellectual property. So uh, we weren't, didn't have any, we weren't making any different paddleboard than anybody else. There were 80 competitors in the thing or our, our expertise was, you know, search engine optimization and nobody even, uh, most of the sharks didn't even understand what the hell I'm talking about there. Cuban sort of got it. But the rest of them are just like, yeah, whatever. And so for about halfway through this, and they didn't air any of this, but I said, you know, okay, whatever. You guys don't like the paddle boards. I get that, right? 
but I'm like this search engine optimization, we can do this for any company, right? And it's actually hard to do what I'm doing where you start from zero and you grow that company to a million dollars or, or, or beyond. That's difficult. Right. What's easy is you buy a $10 million company, you inject what I know and we sell it for 30 million, like a couple of years later. And I said, <laughs> you know, if you guys don't like the paddle boards, it's fine. You guys probably have a bunch of companies. Just bring me in and I'll, I'll inject what I know and we'll, we'll do a business flipping companies. <laughs> so I changed what I was pitching them, right? And they didn't, uh, and they didn't air any of this. And then all of a sudden, Mr. Wonderful and Cuban are like bidding against each other <laughs> on this. They're like, yeah, this would be great. This would be great if I could just inject and flip. Um, uh -huh. because I knew Ed Kevin had made his uh, money by, um, basically just acquiring companies or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of his, his game. And they loved that. And that's really what they were bidding on, not the paddleboard company. And then, but then the, the producers had to edit that all together. So it, it looked like, oh my God, this guy's an idiot. He's an idiot. He's an idiot. What? Mark Cuban gives him a big deal. Nobody else can even understand why it didn't make <laughs> a bunch of sense. Yeah. That's that's interesting. Wow, I didn't know that. I was trying to find the full full episode, but I think I had to like make an account. Yeah, they're hard to find. They're hard to find. But season two, yeah, that's really early. And well, we were on season three. They called us during season two because they were they were oh, sort of you know, lining up the uh, the pitches for the next season. Yeah, that makes sense. You're actually, uh, and I should probably say this out to, to the list any listeners. This is actually my last episode for season one of this podcast. Oh, so you're the, congratulations. You're the, yeah, thank you. You're the last entrepreneur that I'm having on the show. And I'm like ramping up already interviews for the next season and also bringing on a new co-host since uh, last year or this co-host that we had is moving on to bigger and better things. I digress. So back onto your uh, business, Stefan. Now the pandemic has hit. Was there anything that was affecting your sales or your business during this pandemic? And how did you overcome those struggles during that time? Yeah. So, uh, like I said, we have an event space. So the event space went to zero overnight and we just mm. pumped in about $300,000 to remodel this event space. And so that was, that was definitely a problem. Yeah. Um, and we were, uh, we were a declining revenue company because we, we grew up to about seven and a half million in revenue. But at the time, four and a half million of that was on Amazon. And then in about 2017, we realized that the ship has sailed on Amazon as far as you know, like making a product and selling it on Amazon. You can't really be profitable at that. You can drive revenue, um, mm -hmm. but you can't really be profitable and it gets less profitable every year. And uh -huh. so we saw the light at the end of the tunnel and we started to make our exodus from Amazon and really retrenching to sell like truly direct to consumer. Um, because mm -hmm. it got to the point early days of Amazon and we were actually like a, you know, a poster child for selling at Amazon in 2014, 15. Uh, we were actually in Jeff Bezos letter to his stockholders in 2016. I mean, I've named oh, wow. in there tower paddleboards as, as this, you know, shining star little company that Amazon is helping to, you know, bring paddleboards to people, mm. but they started to eat their young, uh, in about 2016, <laughs> 2017. <laughs> and we said, all right, let's, let's, uh, find the door. Um, yeah. And so we walked away, but that's really a tough thing for a company to do is walk away from more than 50% of your revenue intentionally. Yeah. But a lot of peak companies have not done that. And the reckoning is coming. I'm, I'm telling you. Any, anyway, we knew it was coming, but to, to walk down from seven and a half million, we got all the way down to a $2 million company in 2019. And uh, our bank was getting really nervous and they defaulted our loans. And we, we, it's never that we didn't pay them. It's just the bank got nervous. They didn't like our balance sheet, basically. And I'm like, look, I took profits from this. We diversified. We started in, uh, Tower Electric Bikes. We started the uh, event space. We're a much stronger company today. You know, but the bank, bankers are kind of idiots. You know, when they, they don't really invest money when you need it. When you say, if you give me money, I can make money with it. They only give you money if you already have money. And <laughs> it just, just doesn't it jive doesn't with like entrepreneurship. Yeah. Um, so I thought I had a very healthy business, but the bank is now all of a sudden worried. So they're doubling our interest rate and doing crazy stuff there. That's the only thing that can damage us is if they freeze, you know, lending to us. Um, so going into the pandemic, that's where we sat. And honestly, I thought, man, maybe we're, maybe we're done here. And so we just finally got the last of things off Amazon and we just dropped our prices like 30%. And that magically uh, started us growing again. And then another two months later, even though the event space was at zero, mm -hmm. uh, our paddle boards and tower electric bikes both got a boom. 
a bump because of COVID because they're sort of outdoor activities. Right. So and that's safer. like, you know, stand up paddle boarding is like the ideal thing to do if you want to socially distance. There's nobody out there on the water and you're getting exercise and you're getting outside into nature. So that started to bump. And then the bikes, I mean, the, the electric bike industry was already growing at a rapid pace. Mm-hmm. Um, and this just took it to another level. I mean, like if you went to a bike store here in San Diego, I don't know how it was where you're at. There was one point in maybe May or June where there was no bikes in the bike stores. Like they were mm-hmm. just empty. Yeah, same here. You couldn't, couldn't find a bike. Yeah, so that was nuts. And that's still happening today, like with the, um, you know, sort of the production lines are like way behind. I'm mean, like, mm-hmm. if you want a bike, uh, I would say buy it early in the summer because <laughs> there are going to be stockouts. Because That's it's true. like, oh, you want tires for your bike? That's going to be 12 to 14 months. Oh, <laughs> so a lot of companies are not going to be able to deal with that. Um, we sort of, uh, we were a small enough company and we've experienced this rapid growth before that we're sort of already planning for this sort of rocket ship growth. So we're pretty well positioned. But I think a lot of companies are going to have trouble with that. Supply chains are stressed right now. People would feel more inclined to buy products like this. Once the entire country is open up and the pandemic is just, it's everyone ha- is vaccinated. How how are you planning to market your business once everything is, everything is opened up in the U.S.? Well, honestly, they were. I think the bump was because it was closed because they needed an outlet and you couldn't spend money on uh, you know vacations and travel and stuff like that. So if you, and I don't know if you've flown out of the, the West Coast here, but if you fly out of L.A. or the Long Beach yeah. area. There's like a hundred container ships just sitting off the coast at all times <laughs> Yeah, because all of a sudden people just started buying stuff, right? And all the stuff comes from China. That's kind of where it's all made. And so that, that whole channel is just clogged up because people have been buying stuff. I think when the pandemic opens up, people are going to stop buying stuff. Like they bought enough stuff for probably the next three years mm-hmm. and they're just going to start buying experiences. They're going to really start traveling. We see our event space really taking off. This is why our, you know, our diversification is like essential. Like, you know, we didn't know the pandemic was going to come along and it killed one of our businesses and propped up two of our other businesses. Something else will happen and maybe it will kill the paddleboard business, but the bike business will take off. So I think it's really, really important, uh, you know, especially for your listeners that are looking to go into business. The world is changing at such a rapid pace today that you you have to create a diversification. You have to figure out how to make your company anti-fragile because if all your uh, eggs are in one basket, you're, you're just literally not going to last. It's just too, right. too competitive. It's too hard. Yeah. And then going into like, you know, being relevant and competitive in, in this new age, I wanted to actually talk about your website and I'm going to try to word this the best that I can. <laughs> um, good thing that there's editing on this, but no, no, no. I know exactly what you're going to say. <laughs> uh, hopefully... Everybody higher into the company says the exact same thing. Okay. So maybe hopefully it will. So I'm looking at your website and digital marketing is important to a lot of like e-commerce businesses when introducing new products. And I've noticed that I can tell if I looked at your website and I worked at Yelp. So I looked at so many websites from different companies. I'm like, I could tell this guy was during the the dot com b- boom. His website looks like early two thousands. It looks a little newspapery. There's a lot of words. I know millennials and Gen Z. We don't like reading stuff. We just like interactive websites or, or just clicking and looking at nice pictures and videos. So, what are you doing to keep up with the competition and gain attention to make that website more appealing to younger audiences? Well, you've got to really look at what the purpose of a website is. And, you know, if I look back in 1999, I mean, I literally was coming out of grad school and I was starting a a business plan for a youth hostel, right? And I was just like, and I, in 99, and I was like, "Uh, yeah, and we'll make a website just so we have like a brochure. And a Uh lot of people actually still think that's what a website is, is a brochure, which Uh is craziness because, okay, so you throw up your brochure but nobody knows your brochure is there. You've got to get people to it. How are you going to get people to it? So they say, well, I'm going to buy ads. Okay. Well, you're going to buy ads where on like, you know, Google ads and stuff like that. Okay. Well, you understand that that is a a competitive marketplace, hyper um, efficient, controlled by a monopoly. So the end game of that is uh, you buy ads for $99. This company buys ads for 100. They buy 101, 102, 103, 104 until basically Google takes all of the profit out of that system. It's the same thing uh, how Amazon is set up. 
Like if I sell paddle boards and somebody else sells paddle boards, Amazon's going to take their rev share. And then now they're an advertising company. So I spend 10% on advertising. They spend 50, 20, 25, 30, 35. That's why now in Amazon, Amazon takes 50% of everything. It's basically back to retail. And there's no money to be made there because the efficient system has taken all of the profit out of it. If you're buying advertising today, you're in a losing game. Just It's just a, you're a walking dinosaur. Okay. And if you're selling on Amazon, you're a walking dinosaur. Okay. <laughs> so what is a website? You know, when, when I look at a website, a website is something that drives traffic to itself. So we spend basically no money on advertising. The first four years of our business, we spent zero dollars on advertising. We became the fastest growing company in San Diego wow. with an ugly website. And the reason is the <laughs> ugly website is we basically created a library that sells stuff. It's a very useful. It's very informational. People come there and they get educated. And more importantly, like because of that content, that's why people are coming in for free. So instead of spending a million dollars on advertising, doing four million in revenue, and then you know breaking even or losing a hundred thousand dollars, we don't grow as fast, but we do this sort of grow steady growth. Yeah, yeah. And we look at building a business over twenty or thirty years. And to do that, you have to have a lot of content on your website. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people come in every you know every millennial I hire because we hire kids straight out of school. The first thing they do, they're just like, well, I've got a great idea. We're going we're gonna to make this website look great and flashy and we're going to put some stuff on there and uh-huh. do this. And, <laughs> and I'm like, well, we can do that. But then, uh, you know, you're going to have to go get a job somewhere else because we don't have a business. <laughs> we have a fancy website and now we got to go buy adverts. We've got to play the game that everybody else is playing. We don't play that game. In the history of Tower, we've spent less than 2.6% of our revenue on advertising. And there are a lot of our competitors today, they spend more on advertising than they spend on the paddleboard to sell you one. So oh, you're paying wow. more money for them to advertise to you than you are for the actual product. That's how wow. we can sell a paddleboard for basically half the price now of uh-huh. even people that sell it online. Yeah. So then what did, what did you do in the beginning to, to get your business out there? Who did? Uh, was it all word of mouth? Well, it's, you know, I've been in the game since 1999. Uh (laughs) It used to be you just, you write a bunch of good content and it really, it comes down to you have a great, really quality product and then Mm -hmm. you have a great value proposition. So because, you know, our competitors were like, oh, you know, paddleboard market is exploding. Like we're going to get them in Dick's Sporting Goods and we're going to put them in Costco and we're going to do this and we're going to sell them on Amazon. Okay. We have to give all of those people like a cut. We just said, we're not going to do any of that. We're just going to go direct to consumer. Right. Mm, and so yeah. all of that savings, we're just going to drop the price and our advertising will be our low price, will be our value proposition. And we're going to do it with quality. So a lot of a lot of people say, well, we want to get to a low price. We need to advertise. We need to do this. Let's just make a shit product and put it out there. <laughs> and it's very transactional thinking. But that's uh-huh. and that's how 99 percent of businesses operate is they figure out what their marketing costs are and then they figure out what they can spend on a product. We take it completely differently. We say we want to make the perfect product. What does that thing cost? Okay. And then we're going to just put that into our mind. And the price is the, whatever the price is. Nobody's going to beat us on the price because we have no advertising costs and none of this other stuff. Um, so that's we, we approach it really from have incredible products and then back that up with a value proposition. And then just get your costs super low and just survive. And you're going to grow word of mouth over time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we do yeah. a lot of, uh, you know, PR and, you know, link building and you yeah. know, content creation. Um, but it's not, it's not the fast money. And I think that's what mm. people are intoxicated yeah. by. Like, oh, we're going to raise $100 million. I mean, in the direct that's consumer true. space, there's companies that raise $100, $250 million, and they're out of business three years later. It's also not, I, like I wouldn't, and this is my opinion, but I wouldn't want our listeners to also think when they, you know, when you build it, they'll come kind of mentality. It's because it, like you said, it does take a long time it, uh, to make this consistent stream of revenue and I, I definitely agree with you there that it, it takes a long time and for people that are trying to just get that money real fast you're gonna burn yourself and and then uh, you're not gonna be a successful business and stay for the long run like how long have you stayed in this industry yeah so and you know tower is now a little over 10 years old and you know we've gone through some ups and downs you know we've, we've weathered uh, sort of a couple storms but we're still surviving you know, and I think that's that's sort of the name of the game here. And I think some people just, they, they don't really understand. Like the world 40 years ago, if you look at S&P 500 companies, right? They were on the S&P 500 from the time they appeared on the list to the time they disappear from that list. 
was, I think it was like 40 or 50 years, right? Mm -hmm. That's 40 years ago in the, uh, you know, 80s, 70s and 80s. If you look at that in the past five years, those same companies that appear on that list and disappear, it's 18 years. 18 years. I'm talking about the brand names that everybody knows. Yeah, those yeah. companies appear and disappear in 18 years, right? Mm -hmm. And if you look out 30 years from now, it's going to be five to seven years. So like the big brand companies are appearing and disappearing. The world is moving so fast today. Um, I speak at uh, Harvard. They did a case study on us selling on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And they wrote it maybe in 2016 or something like that. So I yeah. spoke there six or seven times every six months or so. And Amazon has just completely changed. Like mm -hmm. and the, the case study is on Amazon. So every time I'm presenting sort of the same case, but like the, what the strategically correct decision has flipped 180 degrees from, you know, five years ago. So that's how much the world has uh, completely changed. Yeah. And you don't see that back then. You didn't see change happen like that so quickly. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, that's, it's just crazy. Like we're a 10 year old company and we've, we've, you know, we weren't on Amazon to begin with. We ran up with Amazon. We decided Amazon was out. Now we're completely off of Amazon. And now we're building, you know, nomiddleman.com, which we believe is like the Amazon antidote. We think that is like the future of where retail is going. That's kind of where the puck is going. Yeah. And then I, so I want to, I want to move into your book now, because not only have you been a successful business because of of your your products and your practice, but it's also the team that you're with and how you guys function. Tell us a little bit about your book and, and what compelled you to write the five hour work schedule. Yeah. So it's a, the five hour work day and we, we started doing the five hour work day in 2015. And in 2014, we were the number one fastest growing company in San Diego, a private company. We were about a five person team doing about 5 million in revenue as a surf company. And in San Diego, like most people don't even consider surf companies like real companies, right? And we, we basically beat all these like VC funded biotech companies, you know, and they're like, what is going on here? And I'm like, well, the world has basically changed, right? The next year we were on the Inc. 500. And so we had proved that we could grow this, this sort of fast growing company, but we were still a fairly small brand. And I said, okay, how do we turn this into a hundred million dollar brand, like an enduring brand um, in sort of beach lifestyle products. We were in paddle boards at the time and we were diversifying into skateboards and surfboards and snorkel equipment and stuff like that. Even with the e-bikes, we really specialize in beach cruisers. And so the thought was, okay, well, I started studying what the, what the big brands do. And I read this book called, you know, what great brands do. And it was some sort of really contrarian thing and things in there. Um, one of them was interestingly enough that the great brands of the world don't give back. <laughs> they, you know, they don't like start a little side project to, you know, take care of the homelessness or something like that. They believe mm -hmm. what they're doing is giving back. Like if you look at like Southwest Airlines, they don't have like a charity side arm. Their business model is basically making, you know, flying on a plane as cheap as riding on a bus. They're mm -hmm. freeing the masses to go around Tesla. They're basically bringing in, you know, uh, uh, the electric cars and they're solving like greenhouse gas problems or whatever. Right. Like that. Google is making, you know, Im information like accessible, you know, to every. So this is what see, these great brands do. And that was kind of counterintuitive to me. And, but then another thing they do is they live their brand. Right. And here we were. We were a beach lifestyle company. Work hard, play hard, go paddle boarding, you know. But we, we weren't doing it. We were working like startup. Right. <laughs> and so I said, if we want to be that authentic, you know, large brand, we have to start living. We have to start walking the walk. So we're going to do this. And it, I was like, wow, that really, you know, would dovetail perfectly with our brand is the five hour work day because we're a work hard, play hard. I've got these people. This is how I've been working the last 10 or 15 years. All of my entrepreneurial buddies are kind of working five hour work days. They come in, they knock out their work, they walk out in the office and they have this, they live this extraordinary life. So how do you do that? for an entire company. So what kind of incentives can I do? So that's we in 2015, I think we started on like May 1st or June 1st. I said, okay, we're gonna do a three month test. We're gonna go 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. straight through, no lunch. And you gotta walk out the door at one basically. And now you have five hours to do, to be as productive and get as much done as you were doing before. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm gonna give you your life back, but if you can't figure out how to be more productive, you're gonna be fired. So I was trying to give them the incentives that an entrepreneur has. Like if you get your work done, go out, doesn't matter. As long as you're making money and you're taking care of business, go have your extraordinary life. If you start slacking off, 
you're going to go out of business. That is the, that's the real life that I live and all my entrepreneurial <laughs> friends live every day. And it forces productivity, right? So yeah. I, said, I said, that's what we're going to do with, um, with our staff. And so we did that for uh, three months and it was working good. Our revenues were up 50% that year. So we continued to do it for about two years. But there were some, uh, there were some bad parts of it. Really, the reason I did that, I mean, the one was aligning with the brand, but the other was it was 2015. And in 2015, we're at pretty much near full employment in the U.S. In 2010, when we started the company, we were coming out of, you know, the recession and it was super easy to hire people. I could get super sharp people right out of school, bring mm-hmm. them in, not pay them much. And I would just get superstars. That's how we grew that fast company. In 2015, it was like hard to get people that could fog a mirror, you know? And I'm just like, I got to figure out something. So I got to figure out a way to attract these people that work at three times the speed of everybody else. So I got to give them a better deal. And so that was really, uh, you know, what we did. It was the intent was to attract better people and then get them to stay with the company for a long period of time. But on that front, it didn't work. Yeah, I read that some people left after they you tried that five the five hour work day. Yeah, it was well, it, it wasn't like they left right away, but after okay. about almost two years into the experiment, we had a team of nine, and I lost four people within a ninety day period. I mean, oh, these wow. are young people, and they had a five hour work day, and they're being paid really well. And I'm like, why are people leaving? This doesn't make any sense. These are people in their young twenties making pretty good money with a with a five hour work day. It was just sort of odd to me. I thought, well, maybe they just don't care about the five-hour work day. Uh, maybe they sort of see it as an entitlement. And then I thought we also maybe broke the company culture because before mm. we were a startup working in the trenches, everybody, uh, you know, you sort of form these strong bonds with one another. Right. Um, in a company like that, it's kind of hard to leave. That startup culture is, is sort of a, a very powerful thing of keeping people there because you're doing something, you're working hard, right? And... Um, you know, we, we sort of broke the company culture, I think, is what happened there. When, he, when they walked out the door at one o'clock, the rest of their lives became, you know, much bigger. And work was just this thing you did before noon to afford yourself this luxury lifestyle, which was great for the employees. But I was doing this. I wanted to give them something, but I also wanted to squeeze productivity out of people. And I wanted to attract these people and keep these people. And it really didn't work for that because the people were leaving. So to me, I just came to the conclusion that they really didn't care about the five-hour workday. I could have been, you know, like taking Elon Musk's approach and have him work 100 hours a week. You know, mm-hmm. they, people go to those jobs, they come to these jobs. And then the money didn't matter. Like, they would start them at a certain salary. I could double that salary in a couple of years and they would be happy to come at that salary and, uh, you know, excited to leave at the other salary. It's like people didn't care about money, they care about the work hours. Mm-hmm. So I think really that was a, a misnomer that the five hour workday was going to be some bullet to get all the good employees. And, you know, retain them for a long period of time, because I think really why we were already getting good people coming into the company. We always have just because we're a a beach lifestyle company. We're sort of a little techie because we're a direct to consumer company. We've got, you know, Cuban and the Shark Tank thing. So there's a little sexiness there. Really, we were attracting people because they came for sort of the mission or they really wanted to be in a sort of a surf type company. And those are the people that we were retaining. So that had much more to do with it than our our work day. But on the flip side, there were some things that we really benefited from with the five-hour workday. The sort of mindset at the company of uh, identifying and using productivity tools. We really became a company that did that. And I think that's a very valuable thing. So when we got away from the five-hour workday full-time year-round, uh, we went to doing it summers only. We do it for four months, January 1st to the end of August. Um, and that's when we did 70% of our revenue too. We squeeze people for time because that squeezing them for time is a, is a, a constraint that makes them find creative solutions. And then in the off season, we'd go to startup hours. So that helped our company culture. And we did that nice, and yeah. right up till the pandemic until we were about to go out of business. And then we, uh, I said, we got to double down. We're getting away from it. And we ended up doubling revenues in 2020. So now we're on this growth trajectory again. We're basically in the same place with Tower Electric Bikes, where we were with Tower Paddle Boards in 2010, 2011. And now we can see the future. But now we're switching the five-hour workday experiment to only doing it in years following when we increased revenues. So it becomes mm, okay. not an entitlement, work. but it becomes like a Christmas bonus for everybody on the team that earned it. Because we only have a few minutes left, and I definitely want to be respectful of your time. 
let's go into some leadership questions. I am a firm believer that no matter the failure, you can always learn from it. So I want you to be real and raw with our audience. Have you ever felt in any of your situations with your company like you did not learn anything after something went wrong with the business? Um, you know, I, I pretty much do learn every time, uh, you know, there's a failure. <laughs> Those seems to be some of the most, uh, you know, critical, critical points because they get impressed upon your mind uh, and you fail. And usually failure in a startup is sort of, you know, life threatening to a certain degree. Like when we had these um, these defaulted loans, um, it was like literally there was nothing wrong with the business. But because the bank thought there was something wrong with the business, they were threatening taking, uh, you know, I have like three rental properties up in Washington state. So they were going to take not only take the business, but they were going to wipe out, you know, everything I've accumulated in my uh, life. And I was just like, wow, <laughs> like, that was that was crazy. Like, what yeah. am I doing wrong? And it made me really do an autopsy, autopsy on the business and to see what. Uh, you know, what we were doing right, what we were doing wrong and, and really reassessed like the journey and just what was the, I was like, well, I had a good time and we met a bunch of interesting people that, you know, came and worked here. So I think I've always learned from mistakes. That's good. And then uh, who influences the influencer? What are you reading? Or like, who are you listening to? Who's coaching you throughout your entrepreneurial journey? You know, um, we're just sort of experimenting in, um, in a lot of stuff. We do a lot of experiments and uh, even the five hour workday was sort of an experiment. And um, these new businesses that we try, the the electric bikes is an experiment and if it fails. So there's, there's not too many people you can follow into these areas. I, there's, there's certain, you know, entrepreneurs, obviously I read a lot of, uh, you know, books about entrepreneurs and, and what they're doing to sort of get into their, their head and what they're thinking about and how they think. So, you know, I read, uh, Bezos book. I've read, uh, I read a lot of books about like retail, just like the Walmart guy's book, uh, the Costco guy's mm -hmm. book. And then, you know, Jobs book, Elon Musk's book, uh, a lot of Richard Branson's books. Those are the people that I sort of just read because you can take stuff out of their life. I think that helps. And, and then, um, you're obviously a very successful entrepreneur of many startups. So this question is geared towards balance in your life. So what things do you need to let go of as an entrepreneur when starting your business? You mentioned a little bit before it was Amazon. Is there anything that's like personal, you know, how there's maybe some weaknesses that you need to let go of or something that yeah, you have someone you, else take care of? I think you have to, you have to focus. And, you know, that, that was one of the interesting things after I got on um, Shark Tank, all of a sudden people thought that I was like, uh, you know, an SEO expert. You know, I was an SEO expert before and I wasn't even that good of an expert. And then after people thought I was really an expert and I was like speaking to audiences and I'm like 75% of you people in here know more about this than I do. Most likely I'm not really that good, but now you think I am because I've been on TV. But one of the interesting things that, that came out of that is I got introduced to a lot of other you know, entrepreneurs and successful business people and growing up sort of the idea of the business, the successful businessman was the, you know, the fat cat banker smoking cigars and, you know, and drinking. And it was sort of, you know, divorced and, you know, rich and, um, <laughs> you know, that model. And then when I met all of these people that are like modern day successful, they have healthy relationships, uh -huh. um, you know, they're in shape. They have, they, they, it's not like the, everything was distributed like uh you know like you're either this or you're that it's like they sort of had it all figured out and i was like man this is sort of an interesting crew of people here like what are they doing uh -huh. right and one thing i learned that they do is you basically can't focus on everything right but the the way to deal with that is what they called cycling so you would take uh you know four months and you would focus on your relationships right mm, build your health yeah and then four months and you focus on your business and then four months and then focus on your health. And then you start doing that, which is interesting right now. I've just spent the last four months like focusing on my business. We're coming into the busy season. And I've really been sort of grinding on that. And now the next four months, you know, I just for the first time I went paddle boarding like around this island. It's like, I don't know, maybe a five mile loop in the, in the mornings and, you know, jogging and stuff like this. I need to nice. focus on my health. And if you cycle like that, you can focus for four months at a time on something. If you try to do it year round, you're going to get burnt out of that one thing. And then if you try yeah. to focus on all the things, you're not going to do any of them well. 
So right. you let a couple things slide or just let them go on autopilot while you focus on one thing. And this process of cycling, I found, was a very uh, powerful concept. What did you uh, hear about that? Or is there any other people that, that do something similar? You know, I don't know. It was, it was at this conference. I think I heard a couple people like, you know, talking about this and they were just like, you know, how do you find the balance in, in, in life? And that's, this, this, well, you focus on a different thing at a different time. Like, don't try to do it all. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. That that's very helpful to just do things in cycles like that because you will become good at everything, but you won't become a master at one thing if you continue to just try to do everything all at once. Sure. Yeah. Now, to close it up, if you have one piece of advice to a college student or an aspiring entrepreneur out there that wants to start their own business, what would that be? Um, I think the biggest thing is is about understanding like burn rate and how important that is. Because when I came out of college, I was like, well, I'm going to go work for somebody for, you know, five years and then I'm going to start my own business. And if you get too far into that career, all of a sudden you're making a six figure salary. You might be married. You might have a mortgage. You might have like this high burn rate. And all of a sudden, so to start a business now, you've got to leave a hundred thousand dollar job and you've got, you know, you're burning like a bunch of cash. Okay. So you may have the experience of, you know, some business experience, feel a little more confident in going and doing what you're going to do, but you're in this really tough position because your opportunity cost is like off the charts, right? And then if you look at the typical college kid, like when I was in college, it's like you're living with five roommates, uh, you're eating top ramen, like you can live on nothing, <laughs> right? You don't have any mortgage. There's no job to lose because your job is kind of a crappy job anyways. Like yeah. you wouldn't mind walking away from him. If you think about it in that way, that's the time to start the business is when you're young and it doesn't matter if you fail because you're already a failure. <laughs> you know, you're pretty <laughs> close to zero nothing. already. You know? So that, I think that is how if I was to walk back to when I was 16 or 17 years old, I mean, I was 16 years old. And I was snowboarding and at a, like our mountain, this is 1988, right? And I'm like, man, this is going to be the next biggest thing. I mean, like I was one of the first five people on the mountain snowboarding. This is back when like Burton and those companies were founded. And I'm like, <laughs> I should start a snowboard company. <laughs> I should have. <laughs> yeah. But, but I, was, I wasn't confident enough to say that I could do that or I didn't want to try because I, wasn't, uh, I didn't have expertise. No, you should just go after it and fail a couple times. And you'll figure it out along the way. That's the time to start because you have the burn rate advantage. That ma that trumps the um, the experience advantage in my book anytime. And even as a company today, like with Tower uh, Paddleboards, like we try to get a negative burn rate because we're all about mm -hmm. like survival. You've got to be anti fragile today. Just you need to survive. We've survived ten years. If we can survive twenty years. We're going to be the top brand in the industry because we're the one that survived that long. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on our show, sharing this incredible wisdom that you have in this industry. And uh, I mean, I'm excited. I, I'm definitely, I was looking at your, uh, your paddle boards and they look really, really cool. And I, I actually love kayaking. So any kind of water sport is just fun to me. So and if, for anyone out there that wants to uh, buy some, Paddleboards, check out Stefan's website. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, towerpaddleboards.com. Yep, home of the $429 paddleboard. <laughs> yes, $429. That's a great that's a great price because I looked up, REI had some $1,000 paddleboards and yeah. all this fancy stuff. Some like track your, I think some track like when you're rowing the paddleboard, I guess. Yeah. There's the tech part of it. <laughs> uh, but thank you again, Stefan, for being on our show. Yep. Hey, thanks for having me on, Jonathan.